Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the oneness in Christ. And of course, that's a, a, a very sophisticated Christian term for unity. This particular lesson focuses on unity and broken relationships. What happens when a relationship is fractured for some reason? It's lesson number 10 in our series for December 8 of 2018. And as usual, we'd like to start with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we have come here to open your word, to think about what it means and help others if possible how to understand it more clearly. We thank you for the words. May they be a part of our speech every day as our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, you might think that after that incredible experience at Pentecost, there would never again be any conflicts within the Christian church, right? Mm -hmm. Well, so let's look at some times when there were some misunderstandings and see if there's anything important for us to learn from those experiences. We, we need to be reminded that the greatest demonstration of the gospel's power should be seen in the lives and actions of church members and church groups. Well, in previous lessons, we discussed the fact that Paul and Barnabas were set apart and ordained by the church at Antioch to go out on that first missionary journey. Although we do not know exactly why or how it happened, John Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, accompanied them through Cyprus, out to, went out to the island, they traveled pretty much the full length of the island, and then they got on a ship and traveled across to Perga and Pamphylia. Well, when they got there, because of the difficulties of the way and perhaps some other factors, John Mark left them and returned home, Acts 13, 13. Sometime later, Paul and Barnabas discussed the possibility of going on a second missionary journey. Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them again, but Paul voiced his opinion very strongly against it. And Ellen White tells us something about that. Carrie? Yes, this desertion caused Paul to judge Mark unfavorably and even severely for a time. Barnabas, on the other hand, was inclined to excuse him because of his inexperience. He felt anxious that Mark should not abandon the ministry for he saw in him qualifications that would fit him to be a useful worker for Christ. That came from page 170 of the Acts of the Apostles. Okay. What important thing did John Mark do for us? Wrote the book of... Wrote, wrote the very first gospel, the book, book of, of the book of Mark. Yes. Okay, well, if you just read Paul's writings without knowing a historical or anything about this experience and the book of Acts is set aside, you're just looking... Sometimes Paul is called the apostle of forgiveness and you, you can understand that reading things, whatever. But um, he was pretty hard on John Mark. Was that his perpetual attitude or did his attitude change? It changed. It changed. He appreciated John Mark later and asked for his help on several occasions. Look at Colossians 4 verses 10 and 11. Aristarchus, who is in prison with me, sends you greetings and so does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. So there's no question about who this is. You've already received instructions to welcome Mark if he comes your way. Joshua also called Justice. Send greetings too. These three are the only Jewish believers who work with me for the kingdom of God and they have been a great help to me. So, did Paul think that they were useful? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Only, now, now he's talking about his second imprisonment in Rome. Only Luke was with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he can help me in the work. So, what can we say here? Has their relationship been restored? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. It, would, it would really be nice if we had more details about why it broke up and how it came back together again, but that's something we'll have to wait for the panorama when we, we see the great controversy presented in the sky and when God tells us about all the... We're going to spend the rest of eternity studying the incredible plan of salvation that took place here. So I'm, I have lots of questions, but I'm, I'm willing to be a little patient. A little patient. 
It would be interesting to know where Barnabas and Mark went when Paul and Silas went one way. Oh. What, where did Barnabas? They went to Cyprus. And Mark. because that, of course, is Barnabas's yeah. home. Yeah. So they went to Cyprus. We don't know if they stayed there, went somewhere else later, or what. But we do know they went. The the yeah. verse just says they went. They sailed off for Cyprus. That's what we know. I always thought Mark was quite a bit younger than Paul yeah. and Barnabas. So maybe he was a cousin's son, a cousin once yeah. removed. Well, but you can have cousins that are fairly, quite a bit younger than you are. Possible. Well, there's a second story we will consider in this lesson. is the story of Paul and Onesimus. Onesimus had been a slave of Philemon who lived either in Colossae or possibly Laodicea. What do we know about Colossae and Laodicea? These two cities, small cities, were located on opposite sides of a valley, and in that a little bit further up that valley was, oh no, I'm sorry, Hierapolis and, Laod and Laodicea on the opposite sides of the valley, and a little further up the valley is Colossae. All three of them, tri tri like tri uh, triple, triplet cities or something like that there. there. And of course, we know, we know a lot about Laodicea um, and so forth, but, uh, these people came from there. Onesimus had come from there. Apparently Onesimus had stolen something from Philemon, probably some money or something that would give him, be able to get him to Rome and escape to Rome. There he somehow met Paul and became a Christian. How would you like to have been present when Paul turned to Onesimus and said, okay, now that you're a Christian, it's time to go back. Can you imagine what that conversation was like? Well, Paul was in prison. He was, he was under house arrest. So, I mean, how did Onesimus get there? And how, did, how was he attracted? We just don't know any of those yeah. things. Divine appointments. Yeah. Well, it was nearing the end of Paul's first imprisonment in Rome, and he was planning to send Tychicus back to Ephesus and Colossae with letters to those churches. He determined that he should send Onesimus with Tychicus. He wrote a short letter to appeal to Silemon to accept his runaway slave back again. It's important for us to recognize that runaway slaves were very harshly treated in those days. Often they were killed. They tried to imagine Tychicus and Onesimus approaching the home of Philemon. Would you like to have been on that journey? Yeah. We don't, do not know if Onesimus um, carried the letter himself or if Tychicus carried it and gave it to Philemon first. Well, look at, this, look at the story, the, the book of Philemon. We're going to read the whole book of Philemon. Imagine that we're going to read a whole Bible book mm -hmm. you know, in the next couple, two or three minutes here. Uh, Fargot? Okay, this is Philemon, a uh, letter to Philemon from Paul a prisoner for the sake of Christ Jesus, and from our brother Timothy, to our friend and fellow worker Philemon, and the church that meets in your house, and our sister Appia, and our fellow soldier Ar Archip Archippus. Archippus. May God our Father and the Lord of our Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. That's a nice introduction. Brother Philemon, every time I pray, I mention you and give thanks to my God. For I hear of your love for all God's people and the faith you have in the Lord Jesus. My prayer is that our fellowship with you as believers will bring about a deeper understanding of every blessing which we have in our life in union with Christ. Your love, dear brother, has brought me great joy and much encouragement. You have cheered the hearts of all God's people. <laughs> you know, he must have been pretty well known by Paul, and then he discovered that Onesimus is, knew him too. Yeah, <laughs> he exactly. becomes converted, and it. Y you wonder how that. And then you wonder if Paul discovery. knew him while he was working yeah. with Philemon. He yeah, did Phil was Philemon already a Christian when Onesimus decided to leave? We just don't know. Those, yeah, those, it sounds those are, like it when Paul's writing back. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That would be a very interesting. Well, there's lots of exciting, Someday fun we things. We, the stories are going to have all kinds of depth that we can't imagine from the little bit we have here when we, when we hear the rest of it.
Dennis, carry on. For this reason I could be bold enough as your brother in Christ to order you to do what should be done. <laughs> but Notice it's what should be done. <laughs> but because I love you, I may re make a request instead. I do, do this even though I am Paul, the ambassador of Christ Jesus, and at present also a prisoner for his sake. So I make a request to you on behalf of Onesimus, who is my own son in Christ. For while in prison I have become his spiritual father. At one time he was of no use to you, but now he is useful both to you and to me. And I need to interrupt there again for a second. The word, the word Onesimus means useful. So mm. Paul is playing on his name here. Mm. Okay. I'm sending him back to you now, and with him goes my heart. I would like to keep him here with me while I'm in prison for the gospel's sake, so that he could help me in your place. However, I do not want to force you to help me. Rather, I would like you to do it of your own free will. <laughs> so I will not do anything unless you agree. Jackie? Okay. It may be that Onesimus was away from you for a short time so that he might have him, you might have him back for all time. And now he is not just a slave, but much more than a slave. He is a dear brother in Christ. How much he means to me and how much more he will mean to you, both as a slave and as a brother in the Lord. So, if you think of me as your partner, welcome him back just as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to my account. <laughs> I love this. Here, I will write this with my own hand. I, Paul, will pay you back. I should not have to remind you, of course, that you owe your very self to me. <laughs> So my brother, right. <laughs> so my brother, please do me this favor for the Lord's sake. As a brother in Christ, cheer me up. Okay, Jim, you want to carry on there? I am sure as I write this that you will do what I ask. In fact, I know that you will do even more. At the same time, Get a room ready for me because I hope that God will answer the prayers of all of you and give me back to you. Okay, and let me interrupt again for a second. Do you think Paul planned to pay anything back? <laughs> no. He says, I'm coming to see what you're going to do what, what should be done. He already said what should be done, right? Manipulation. No, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no pressure at all. Doesn't it sound like manipulation? <laughs> okay. I paid it back, I think, if. Oh, yeah. If, if, or if, uh, it, it's pretty clear that he didn't think he would be paying it back. When you think of his background, he basically is a lawyer. Yeah. He's kind of manipulating the whole yeah, scene that's there. That's what it sounds like to me. <laughs> he, he was good with words. He yes. was very good with words. Okay, Jim. Epaphras, who is in prison with me for the sake of Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. And so do my fellow workers, Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Notice again, once again, who is the first one of the fellow workers that's mentioned? Mark. 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 That's a good news translation. Yeah. Well, what do you think? Do you think Paul ever paid anything back to Philemon? I don't think Philemon would have taken it if he did. No. <laughs> well, if this was his second time in prison, he, I don't think he made it out of there, did he? No, this was his first time. Oh, this is right his at first the time. end of his first imprisonment, and okay. he he because if you read the story, he sent the books of of Ephesians and Colossians with Tychicus at the same time, and so Onesimus was traveling with Tychicus back to that same spot. So this was, and Paul was really shortly thereafter. So he wasn't just blowing smoke here, he, he had serious plans. Okay. Well, here's a very interesting possibility. Do we have any idea what the outcome was of Paul's writing of this letter? What happened to Onesimus? It is interesting to notice that in about 110 AD, Bishop Ignatius of Antioch wrote a letter to the Bishop of Ephesus, who was a man named Onesimus. Now, 
Onesimus was a fairly common name, especially for slaves, and it, me and it meant useful. Notice Paul's play on the, on the name back in Philemon 11. We looked at that. Do you think this could have been the same Onesimus? Edgar Goodspeed really played this up in his book, uh, Introduction to the New Testament, page 121. It is, is it possible that Onesimus may even have helped to collect all Paul's letters together to form what we know as the New Testament? Many scholars believe that this may have taken place in Ephesus. Mm. It's fascinating to consider the possibility that this same slave, Onesimus, may one day have been the bishop or elder of Ephesus. This is particularly significant in light of the fact that Ephesus apparently became the publication center for the early Christian church. What do we mean by a publication center? Well, they cop er, copied manuscripts. Copy. And yeah. yeah, remember in those days it wasn't, you know, they turn on the printing the press and psh, they kick it out. You, you had to copy everything by hand. Mm -hmm. And remember that Ephesus is a place famous for its books because 50, that huge library was burned because of their giving up on the, all those pagan gods and so forth. I mean, thousands and th what we figured out one time was 200 years worth of work or something was burned in that bonfire. Amazing, amazing stuff. So it's very likely, well, it's, there's pretty good evidence that Ephesus became a kind of copy a, a book of the Bible and send it off to this church and copy another book of the Bible and send it off to that church and so forth. So is it possible that Onesimus might have had something to do with all that? Mm -hmm. well, if he was a young man, very young man at the time, yeah. what, uh, what year was, was, was Paul in prison the first time? 60s. About 80, 60, 61, 62, somewhere there. So we're this would be 50 years later. Yeah. So if he was a young man. Yeah. Well, remember that John later was uh, one of the leaders in Ephesus when he was 90. Yeah. So it's possible. Well, why didn't Paul just tell Philemon that good Christians should not have slaves? Wouldn't that be appropriate? Well, where would where would he go in that culture? Uh, can uh, well, if he was if he was later uh, the bishop there in Ephesus, then he would have been released. The layman did him a favor and gave him freedom. Mm -hmm. That's possible. But in the Roman times, a good share of the population were actually slaves. It's mm -hmm. estimated that six, sixty percent. Now, this was not slaves as we have thought about them in more modern times. These were people, in, and in some of them were, were, were slaves because they were conquered by the Roman army, some. A lot more were slaves because they couldn't pay their bills. And so a person could actually sell themselves into slavery to pay off their bills. And they would work for somebody for a year or two or however long it took, got their debts paid off, and then they would be free and they would go again. Sometimes so, they were teachers. They so, taught the kids. How many? Yeah, some of them, even physicians, Jesus. private physicians, yeah. They, some of them were very well educated. Um, I wonder how many slaves would be in our society if everybody who was in debt was a slave. <laughs> well, they, they kind of are. <laughs> we rule over the poor and the bar was a slave of the lender, yeah. Proverbs 22.7. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, did Paul didn't, what, did Paul give a speech about the evils of slavery? No. Not really. No. <clears throat> What would happen if all Christians read the book of Philemon and behaved accordingly? Would there be any slavery anywhere? I don't think so. Mm -mm. Well, what did Paul say about slavery in other places? Do you remember Galatians 3.28? So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. And then he goes on, if you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. Even if you're not a Jew, how could that be? Hmm? And then Colossians 3, verses 10 and 11. And have put on the new self. This is the new being which God, its creator, is constantly renewing in his own image in order to bring you to a full knowledge of himself. As a result, there is no longer any distinction between Gentiles and Jews, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarians, savages, slaves and free, but Christ is all, 
Christ is in all. By the way, just for interest's sake, we know what's the difference between a Jew and a Gentile? What's the, the, what's the distinction there? The, the Jews practice circumcision and they... Okay, but I mean, in, just in terms of definition of the word. Jews were descendants of Abraham, yes, belonged to the tribe, well, descendants basically of, of Judah, basically, or, yeah. or his... Uh, and what's a Gentile? Anybody who's anybody not... Anybody else. else. Anybody non else. Any non-Jew. What's the difference between a Greek and a barbarian? Same thing. No, a no. Greek... Barbarians were those who didn't speak Greek. Okay. And why were they called barbarians, do you know? Believe it or not, the Jews said, I mean, the oh, Greeks oh, said, anybody who can't speak Greek is just bar, 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 yeah, bar. Barbarian. And so they're called barbarians. <laughs> is that right? That's, that's <laughs> actually <That's> wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, so did Paul think that all Christians should be treated as equal? Yes. He certainly showed his love for both Philemon and Onesimus, didn't he? And he, he was really, really was trying his best to bring about resolution. Fortunately, in most parts of the world, slavery is completely forbidden today. But what lessons might we learn from this experience that could help us in, the, in our relationships in our day? Or is this just an outdated story? What do you think? And look, <coughs> looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So, and if we are a new creature in Christ, then new things have come. The old things have passed away. So, we still have to kind of deal with it. I mean, Paul still had to deal with slaves, you know, and he sort of in that context still recognizes slavery, you know. Yeah. But, uh, but we don't have to uh, in Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, should it ever be the role of church leaders to demand that people do this or that or the other thing? No. Well, Well, evidently it's okay. <laughs> well, we but well of, demand is, yeah. A, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. We need to think of all people that we are all children of God. Amen. And mm -hmm. treat them accordingly. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Paul took the winsome route not the demanding route, and it's a very appealing book. And it might be, it might be the fact that Onesimus became the, he might have become the leader of the church in, in Ephesus, that might be the reason why this letter, this little, tiny little book is included in our New Testament. Oh, that's a thought, yeah. In, uh, I lost, the, oh, it's Hebrews 13, uh, 17, obey your leaders and submit to them for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable to you. Uh, but obedience is something we give, and it talks about submission. It's not something the leader necessarily demands. Uh, they attempt to, to lead the flock, so to speak. And, okay. And those... Uh, they're ne not necessarily forcing them to follow. So, I, but it's a reminder that we are to submit ourselves to one another. It's very interesting that Ellen White makes it quite clear, but you don't hear the pastors talking about this for some obvious reasons, that the pastor's job is not to stand up and preach. But pro the pastor's job is to organize the congregation to go to work. Mm. And she says that quite bluntly in a number of places. We don't talk about that too much. Well, Paul, okay, is now going to talk a little bit about some of the problems that arose in the church. Look, for example, at 1 Corinthians 3, verses 5 through 11. After all, who is Apollos and who is Paul? We are simply God's servants by whom we, you were led to believe. Each one of us does the work which the Lord gave him to do. I sowed the seed. He's talking about the church at Corinth, of course. I sowed the seed. Apollos watered the plant. But it was God who made the plant grow. The one who sows and the one who waters really do not matter. It is God who, who matters because he makes the plant grow. There is no difference between the one who sows and the one who waters. God will reward each one according to the work each has done. For we are partners working together for God and you are God's field. You are also God's building. Using the gift that God gave me, I did the work of an expert builder and laid the foundation. 
and someone else is building on it, but each must be careful how each one must be careful how he builds, for God has already placed Jesus Christ as the one and only foundation, and no other foundation can be laid. So, what's he trying to tell us there? Even when the pastor moves, don't, don't try to criticize the current pastor because he doesn't sound exactly like your friend who just left that, you know. Because mm -hmm. we, we do have pastors that move around from time to time. And he talks about that in other places. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 11, and 2 Corinthians 10, 12 to 15. And let me just read that first, 2 Corinthians 10 one because that's a very interesting passage. Of course, we would not... Now, here is Paul in his Sinai letter to the Corinthians because they had treated him very badly uh, at one point. And so he, he went back to Ephesus and he said, I need to write a pretty stiff letter to these people. So this is part of what he says. Of course, we would not dare... Because there's other people that come in and were leading... Were, breaking up the church in Corinth and doing all kinds of stuff. Of course, we would not dare to classify ourselves or compare ourselves with those who rate themselves so highly. How stupid they are. They make up their own standards to measure themselves by and they judge themselves by their own standards. Does that ever happen in our day? Mm -hmm. As for us, however, our boasting will not go beyond certain limits. It will stay within the limits of the work which God has set for us. And this includes our work among you. And since you are within those limits, we were not doing, going beyond them when we came to you bringing the good news about Christ. So we do not uh, boast about the work that others have done beyond the limits God has set for us. Instead, we hope that your faith may grow and that you may be able to do a much greater work among you because with it, with, always within the limits that God has set and, and, and so forth. So he's pretty clear that the work that we're supposed to be doing is Spreading the gospel. Well, how long did he spend in Corinth? A year and a half. Well, later, working in Ephesus, he received a letter from them asking about certain issues. He also received some information from the members of Chloe's family who traveled over there, who had apparently traveled to Ephesus. So Paul wrote what we know as 1 Corinthians. The passages mentioned above are examples of very clear, very clear advice from Paul about how they should re resolve some of their differences. But reading between the lines, and not just between the lines, it's pretty clear, we discover that they did not readily receive his advice given in 1 Corinthians. It's sort of hard for us who believe in basic, basic Christian ideas in our day to imagine why someone wouldn't be impacted by reading 1 Corinthians. But apparently they weren't. So he apparently made a brief trip back to Corinth, probably by ship. They were very unfriendly and rebuffed him, and probably led by these other people who were trying to tear the church apart. He returned to Ephesus, and with much prayer and fasting, he wrote a very strong letter, sometimes called a Sinai letter, to them, which is probably what we have in 2 Corinthians 10-13. He sent that letter with Titus, who traveled all the way around through Macedonia to reach Corinth. Then Paul waited and waited. He finally became so concerned that he decided to go himself once again to Corinth, late in the season. Now, if you know anything about the weather in that part of the world, late in the autumn or late in the summer and into the autumn, winds come up, really horrific winds come up through that area and everything, everything shuts down. As far as transportation, even in our day, no, even the ships don't go. Hmm. So late in the season, so Paul had to walk all the way around. I don't know how far it is, but it's a long ways. From Ephesus all the way around through Macedonia and down to Corinth. Now this is his third trip. Yeah. I'm hearing this right. Yeah, that's correct. At the end of his third trip. So um, he kept hoping he would meet Titus and hear what the results of his letter had been. Fortunately, somewhere in Macedonia, the two met. Thus, uh, Titus assured him that they had accepted his letter and were reforming their ways. He then wrote them what we have in 2 Corinthians 1 through 9. It's very interesting. Paul actually wrote four letters to the Corinthians. How do we feel about the way in which Paul dealt with those problems in Corinth? Is this just casual? Well, he was very direct. Off the cuff? 
Yeah. He was very direct. He was very pointed about, you know, separating yourselves uh, from the, this person, not uh, fellowshipping with, with him. Mm -hmm. And oh, actually, if you look, read through First Corinthians, he says concerning this that you wrote, concerning this that you wrote, concerning this that you wrote. He's, and he gives some very good, solid advice, just spelled out like someone who'd been trained in counseling. But apparently it didn't impact him like that Sinai I letter did. <laughs> well, Paul recognized that different people have different gifts and different talents, but they must learn how to work together to spread the gospel. It is natural for us to, to somehow feel that when we are trying to spread the gospel, we are somehow in competition with others trying to do the same. We must not be in competition, but always in cooperation. Okay? This is mine, I guess. All comparisons with others are unwise because they will make us feel either discouraged or arrogant. If we think that others are far superior to us, we will feel despondent when we compare ourselves to them and easily can get discouraged in whatever ministry we are in. On the other hand, if we think our labors for Christ are more effective than, than is the work of others, we will feel proud, which is the last sentiment any Christian should be harboring. Both attitudes cripple our effectiveness for Christ and the fellowship we have with one another. As we labor within the sphere of influence that Christ has given us, we will find joy and contentment in our witness for Christ. Our labors will complete or complement, I'm sorry, the efforts of other members and the Church of Christ will make giant strides <coughs> for the King. And that's from our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Tuesday, December 4th. So, what is the role of forgiveness in dealing with problems within the church? Well, it's part of the grace that we should be extendi extending to one another. Uh, we should not be looking at the outward appearance of things, but uh, mm -hmm. inward. If you forgive someone, are you giving him permission to do it again? No. Hopefully not. <laughs> no. Not, not. Some might mistake it from the, the other end that way. And there's something else here that's, uh, that we really don't often accept. Uh, we don't need to wait for them to come in and confess and repent. We can forgive people before they do any of that. What did, you, what did Jesus say to the people who are nailing him to the cross? Father, Father forgive. forgive them. Father, forgive them. Wow. God is forgiveness personified. And he the didn't soldiers weren't asking for forgiveness. No, they were not asking for forgiveness. Not at all. Okay, Carrie, I think you have something about Jesus' effect on us and so forth. Romans five, eight to eleven. Yes. But God has shown us how much he loves us. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. By his blood we are now put right with God. How much more, then, will we be saved by him from God's anger? We were God's enemies, but he made us his friends through the death of his Son. Now that we are God's friends, how much more will we be saved by Christ's life? But that is not all. We rejoice because of what God has done through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has now made us God's friends. I'm going to take a moment and look at that one sentence in verse 9. By his blood we are now put right with God. How much more then will we be saved by him from God's anger? Hmm. Now to many people, who the, the usual Christian approach is, okay, we have this pile of sins and God agrees to forgive our sins because Jesus died in our place. And that's, that's a fair beginning. I say it's, it's, it's a fair beginning, but we, with the blessings we have of the, all of the Bible and all the writings from Ellen White and so forth, we, I think we should go way beyond that. We need to recognize that his, <clears throat> his life and his death <clears throat> make us friends, as just as Paul is trying to say here. And we should, be, we should go out of our way to to go out and spread God's love and so forth, and the life and the death of Jesus answers the questions in the great controversy and we need to understand that great controversy and then we need to go out and tell people the implications of that great controversy 
And in my opinion, that goes way beyond just, well, so I'm so thankful that God forgave me. Well, we need to, I would suggest we look at the different translation of this, of that uh, passage we had there, Romans 5, uh, 10. Mm -hmm. uh, we're reconciled by his, uh, well, sorry, verse, verse 9 says that we're saved by him from the wrath of God. Well, we need to go back to Romans 1 to explain what God's wrath is. Yeah. Guys, God letting you do what you had a, made up your mind to do. Mm -hmm. God is not going to force you to do. So that is not the best uh, translation that, that in that particular passage. It, they've, you, you. They conflated three verses into one, mm -hmm. or, or maybe it's two verses there, but it's not the best. Yeah, God's the love that he gave. Yeah, now, we don't often think about God's anger. Yeah. When it talks about here, and I'm surprised the Good News Bible uses that phrase. Yep. Like well, we what need to. Well, Romans 1 18 is a classic uh, one that we use, and the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. And I've heard Adventist pastors and preachers talk about it, and they forget to go down to verses 24, 26, and 28, where God will let you go, let you do your own thing. And uh, th that's the explanation of what God's wrath is. It's, yeah. it's not going to... You gonna... might be crying about it rather than... Of course. Anger. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, the word comes from orge, am I correct? It's, which is, which, but uh, you could, there's several translations of that word. It's an emotion. Then. Yeah. Like how, in Ephesians, yeah. or in the Old Testament, where God says, Ephraim, how can I let give you, you up? How can I let you go? Yeah. He was 11.8. Not, not Hebrews, Hosea. Hosea, Hosea 11, excuse Hosea. me, yeah, you're right. Hosea 11, Hosea. 7 and 8, yeah. Jackie, were you going to come in? Say I'm a bully. Mm -hmm. and Please I th <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't be. <laughs> you're playing the role of a bully. I, the moment. In, the fl in my flesh, I am a bully. I am a big, ugly, mean bully. And... God hate. I think God hates sin. So I've got this big sack of bully behaviors and bulliness about me. And he wants me to hate it too. He wants me to give it up to him. Yeah. So I hate my bulliness. And that's the beauty of God yeah. that he can change the bully if the bully wants to be changed. Yeah. That's that I love that. Yeah. Exactly. You can't f intimidate and persuade. God cannot intimidate and does not intimidate and persuade. It, all it does what was this? But he uh, hates Ellen, that big bag ugly. Ellen White says back. that a sullen submission produces the character of a rebel. Yeah. And uh, that's a, a sullen passage. Sullen submission that's, produces yeah. the character of a rebel. Yeah. Well, I'm going to add one more verse. This is a couple of verses actually. Second Corinthians chapter five, verses twenty. And 21, here we are then speaking for Christ as though God himself were making his appeal through us. So Paul says, you know, when we go out and we speak the gospel, what are we doing? We're speaking for God. We plead on Christ's behalf, let God change you from enemies into his friends. Christ was without sin. For our sake, God made him to share our sin. So he said, look, Watch me see what happens when you attach yourself to sin and you refuse to let it go. But for our sake, God made him share our sin in order that in union with him, we might share the righteousness of Christ. Amazing. Well, do confession and repentance always lead to reconciliation? <clears throat> and what do we do if it doesn't? That word reconciliation implies that at some time we were in, in a state of conciliation. Uh, you, to be, be reconciled, uh, but really it's, it's to bring us to a state of conciliation uh, rather than redoing something that wasn't there. Yeah. Well, we know about 1 John 1, 9. When we confess our sins to God, He's faithful to forgive us. But confession is vitally important because what? We have to be aware. It, changes. it initiates a change in our attitude to God, not because it changes his attitude toward us. And that's where there's a huge difference. Many people think, well, Jesus did something on the cross. I don't understand it, but he must have changed God's attitude toward us. No, he didn't change God's attitude to us at all. 
God loved us before that. In fact, that's why he gave his son. Yeah. So um, that's, a, we, that's paganism. Exactly. Confession is vitally important because it, 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 it helps us to change our attitude to God. However, what we really need is a change in our attitude and behavior, not just forgiveness. If someone has truthfully wronged us, we need to be just as forgiving as God is. Think, think mortal, ordinary human beings could do that? By faith, yes. By the grace of God. Yeah. What happens if we continue to harbor bad feelings? Festers and eats us up. Yourself, yeah. It's self-destructive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is hurting us. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I unfortunately have had some of these experiences, times when there, I've had some very real differences with some people under in working situations. And you see that person coming, you, you go around the block the other direction. <laughs> I mean, you just you don't have time to you know, get into a conflict with them or whatever. Uh, it's just easier to avoid them. And that obviously is not the Christian way. Well, God has released us from condemnation. He has forgiven our sins. How can we condemn a fellow church member no matter what she or he has done? I mean, shouldn't we forgive them? We should try to bring them to repentance. Uh, but, but in the state of, of having already forgiven them. Look to yourself, yes, lest ye to be tempted. In other words, to be tempted to condemn them. Looking at yourself, how sinful you are. Uh, you should be able to minister to them spiritually. Unfortunately, probably all of us have heard about experiences where some petty, relatively petty thing has divided a church and even caused people to leave. Mm -hmm. How should we resolve those things? One-on-one, okay. on one, I think. Sit down. Um, yeah. in Matthew 18, 15 to 17. Mm -hmm. If your brother sins against you, go to him and show him his fault, but do it privately, just between mm -hmm. yourselves. If he listens to you, you have won your brother back. But if he will not listen to you, take one or two other persons with you so that, you, so that every accusation may be upheld by the testimony of two or more witnesses, as the scripture says. And if he will not listen to them, then tell the whole thing to the church. Finally, if he will not listen to the church, treat him as though he were a pagan or a tax collector. Wow. This is from the Good News Bible. I thought we were supposed to love him. <laughs> well, you can love a pretty definite. But you can love a pagan or a tax collector. You just can't. In uh, theory. You can't walk together with them. Well, yeah, and the point is, if they're doing some obviously sin that a lot of people that are aware of, the church can't, the, the church can't harbor that kind of stuff where people say, well, you know, what's going on here? So how should we treat a pagan or a tax collector? Shouldn't it be with love and caring? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so what do we do? How often, maybe, I don't know, I should ask you, do you all know of times when two people have had real differences and they came together and they settled it and, or they went through these steps step by step? Um, it doesn't happen very often, does it? Oh, i give you an example today. Mm -hmm. Ten days ago, we had quite a misunderstanding and just at loggerheads with something. And today, we talked for the first time in 10 days. And he sat down at the table. Margaret had said, just tell him you love him. <laughs> you should have seen a look on his face <laughs> when I did that. That's wonderful. He stopped a minute. <laughs> and it was a misunderstanding. Yeah. Neither one of us are good listeners. Mm -hmm. So we say things. But when we got done today, everything's back to friendship again. Yeah. Amen. A very good, Just amen. an example. I read that and thought, man, that was exactly what happened between a week ago Monday and today at lunch. So what, what often happens when there's a misunderstanding? You go over and... Yeah. And then over here... And pretty soon, you, you know, there's battle lines drawn up. Yeah. Or they go to the pastor and say, you need to uh, go talk to this yeah, person. You need to deal with this problem. You need to do it yourself first. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The one-on-one -on -one thing. 
Well, occasionally very open transgression against a church member which the party refuses to admit means that he should be put out of the church. Persistent problems like this can tear a church apart. Jim, I think we've got that Do not one. suffer resentment to ripen into malice. Do not allow the wound to fester and break out in poisoned words which taint the minds of those who hear. Do not allow bitter thoughts to continue to fill your mind and his. Go to your brother and in humility and sincerity talk with him about the matter. Ellen G. White from Testimonies, Volume 7, 261. Very good. Well, she said some additional words there. Dennis, I think that might be yours. Um, this uh, first one is from Selected Messages, Book 1, 175. When the laborers have an abiding Christ in their own souls, when all selfishness is dead, when there is no rivalry, no strife for the supremacy, when oneness exists, when they sanctify themselves so that love for one another is seen and felt, then the showers of the grace of the Holy Spirit will just as surely come upon them as God's promise will oh. never fail in one jot or tittle. Wow. wow. Okay. And Jackie, I think you have a, some words on that. Oh, he was going to read the whole thing. Okay. I Go ahead. So. Oh. Or you could. Okay. If we stand in the great day of the Lord with Christ as our refuge, our high tower, we must put away all envy, all strife for the supremacy. We must utterly destroy the roots of these unholy things, that they may not again spring up into life. We must place ourselves wholly on the side of the Lord. Last day events, 190. Yeah. And here's a passage of scripture that sort of says the same thing. This is uh, Hebrews 12, 14 and uh, 15, I think. Uh, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which n no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. Mm. Very good. Well, in those letters that Paul wrote to the churches at Ephesus and Colossians and Ephesus and Colossae, uh, he said these words. This is Colossians 3, verses 12 to 17. Mm -hmm. You are the people of God. He loved you and chose you for his own. So then you must clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, that's obvious and simple. You just put it on, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the you probably all read the story about Benjamin Franklin. And he started out with 13 things that he said, I'm going to be a perfect person and I'll, I'm going to do these 13 things. And his last, last thing on the list was to be humble. And he said, I got down to the bottom and I was so good, I just couldn't be humble. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother. Well, oh. he goes on. Be tolerant with one another and forgive one another whenever any of you has a complaint against someone else. And if a new believer joins a church and they actually saw that kind of behavior going on, how would it impact them? It would free them from the oppression that they've, oppressive place they put themselves in in yeah. this world. You must forgive one another just as the Lord has forgiven you. And to all these qualities add love, which binds all things together in perfect unity. The peace that Christ gives is to guide you in the decisions you make. For it is um, to this peace that God has called you together in the one body. And be thankful. Christ's message and all its richness must live in your hearts. Teach and instruct each other with all wisdom. Sing psalms, hymns, sacred songs. Sing to God with thanksgiving in your hearts. Everything you do or say then should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus as you give thanks through him to God the Father. Do we do that in church? It, it does happen. It does happen sometimes, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
what, how would you like to live in, in, among a group of people who practice that all the time? Well, they'll be in heaven. I was about to say, if, it, if we were doing all that all the time, we would be in a better place, wouldn't we? Be? Yeah, it would just be wonderful. What do you think are the greatest barriers to having this kind of peace, harmony, and unity in the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church? I mean, isn't that what God has called lust us to do? For us, flesh, lust of the eye, and the boastful pride of life, especially wow. the last one. Mm -hmm. Pride of opinion. Mm -hmm. Kind of boils down to selfishness. Mm -hmm. Margaret, you didn't have to be quite so blunt. <laughs> <laughs> well, we always we always seem to think that our opinion is the one that ought to yeah. rule out, ought, ought, ought to predominate, right? Margie, well, oh, you <laughs> nailed it. When you, I mean, what would you have done without her very fine advice I know. with your brother? and your friend. Well, it well, sure worked. Yeah. yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Surely we recognize that the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about healing and transformation. How can we claim that we are preparing for the second coming and that we really want to be like Jesus unless we start practicing? How, how, how does character change take place? Observation. Talking about practice. Okay, what are we observing? Christ. Yeah. By beholding, we become changed. And then? Then we draw others. Okay, well, the something else. Ministry of re reconciliation. Something else needs to happen first. Problems. Seems when I start praying about something, issues and problems and all the things that are going to develop all that good stuff, they bring bad stuff first. You mean Satan is alive and well? Well, well, of course he is, but I, you know what I mean. <laughs> I know, uh, I know. I don't know how well he Morris Venn and used to, preached a sermon one time on, <laughs> about <laughs> doing worse when you pray. <laughs> yeah, because if, if, I mean, let's think about it for a second. The devil has one goal in mind. Get rid of all the good people. And make Isn't you feel that? like a failure. He wants to yeah. make you feel yeah. like you're hopeless. Is it, if, if, God, if Satan could just eliminate all the all the Christians, all the well, all the I, we shouldn't call them Christians because a lot of people calling themselves Christians aren't really. But if Satan could re just get rid of all of God's faithful people, he would say to God, "Okay, God, you can have the rest of the universe. Just leave this world for me and my people, and we'll be just fine here." Yeah. God, how does God respond to that? He says, "Not only am I not going to leave this world to you, I'm going to make this world my future headquarters." It's pretty amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it's amazing. Just amazing thought. Yeah. I wonder, doesn't Satan realize that the result of sin is death and he will wind up there someday? You know, he blocks it out, I think. He couldn't keep working if he did that. Yeah, wow. That's right. They believe and tremble. That's right. Last week we talked about the impact of church members individually and as groups on those around them. If we are fighting and squabbling among ourselves, does that attract people? No. Not at all. If someone wrongs us repeatedly, do we just keep forgiving them? Move. Well, <laughs> 70 <laughs> times 7. <laughs> 70 times 7, Jesus said. Which is <laughs> Get a new address. <laughs> yeah, you might Get your mail someplace else. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly we would all recognize that God's grace and forgiveness has been incredibly extravagant with us. Our attitudes will lead to either the healing of relationships or the destruction of them. Which do we really want? In our lesson, yeah, going to comment? In our lesson for this week, we have seen the cases of two people that Paul dealt with in one way or another. It seems from what we can learn from that in both cases, reconciliation was made that proved to be a great blessing to the church. I mean, Mark wrote that book that was the beginning of the gospel story. Um, anyway, could we live up to that reputation? Forgiveness requires a conscious choice to give up feelings of resentment and anger. Can we do that? If we pray for them, we have Sometimes to put something... Hard. We have to put something good 
in the place of the evil. It's not enough to just try to push the evil away. So if we yeah. pray for that person uh, firmly and earnestly mm -hmm. and labor to, to win them, then that's, that will put away the, the evil stuff that we would want and to harbor. And we don't need to wait, well as Jim has found out today, we don't need to wait for that person to come and confess their sins, whatever they were. Following the example of God, we should offer forgiveness even before a confession is made. Forgiveness will help to root out anger and bitterness in our own lives. How often do differences of opinion because of theological understandings lead to problems? Often in such cases, both sides are sure that they're in the right. I mean, lay down the Bible verses, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is the role of forgiveness and reconciliation in such cases? Could we have theological differences and still come out with a reconciliation? Well, what? it depends on how we approach the interaction with that person. Uh, mm -hmm. It has to be done in a way that, that's loving and, and where you sit down and you show, you know, your, your texts and, and... I mean, so you don't come to them and say, I know you're in the wrong, but I choose to forgive you. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. I don't it doesn't work too well, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as Jim said, Come and say, I love you. Wow. I'll start out by saying, you know, we, I, I said I'm the same as you. We don't mm -hmm. listen very well. The misunderstanding came about because you weren't hearing and I was not hearing either. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't want any hard feelings. Mm -hmm. And we've had this before. I've known this man for about 18 years. Mm -hmm. And one time he wrote me a note on email and said, you are no longer my friend. <laughs> wow. So okay, well, we're not up and down. So. Yeah, we're running out of time. Could you out there follow the example of Christ by offering forgiveness and healing to those who have wronged you or perhaps feel that they have been wronged? <laughs> I know, God forbid that you ever did anything wrong to anybody, but just in case someone feels like you have wronged them, how should you respond? Are we ready to offer the kind of love and forgiveness and, and fellowship and compassion and empathy that God offered us? Think of what it would be like in your church if everyone did that. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have of, of studying together, of thinking about these lessons, of, of learning about you. Um, we have this privilege of, of reaching out to people all over the world through these broadcasts. We ask that lives will be touched and lives will be changed as we share your word with others is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.